Well, okay, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by Dr. Ronald Brown. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most interesting immigration experiences uh, in America, and this is the arrival of the Chinese. Once again, the outline is Confucian background. Who was Confucius? What did he teach? And how did this teaching spread and so influence Chinese society uh, until today? Point two would be the first Chinese arriving in the United States. First big immigration period. And then the reaction against the Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the late 1800s. Point five, 1965, after almost 100 years of banning Chinese migration, the new immigration period began. And then finally, number six, the future of Chinese in America. So let's get going. The Confucian background of Chinese culture. You can't understand Chinese culture without understanding the great teacher Confucius, who lived from 551 to 478 BC, before the Common Era. Well, he was not a prophet. He was not a god. He was not a saint. He was a historian. And his philosophy or religion of Confucianism is a religion that has no God. In Confucianism, when you die, you're dead. If you're going to have heaven and happiness, well, you're going to have to build heaven here on earth. You're going to have to achieve your own happiness because there's no God taking care of you. There is no heaven where you can go when you die or hell to be punished. So for Confucianism, God is this world. And for Confucianists, heaven, even though they use the word heaven all the time, heaven means peace, prosperity, stability, in this world, not up in heaven or in Garden of Eden or someplace imaginary, we can have heaven here on earth. So Confucianists are working people. They're very serious. They educate their children. They build families. They get rich because this is all you get. When you're dead, you are gone. And so Confucian is a, is a very much of a this worldly religion. Most people don't consider it a religion because they say, oh, for religion, you have to have a God. But many religions don't have gods. Uh, uh, Confucianism doesn't have a God. Buddhism doesn't have a God. So these are two of the greatest religions in the world that don't have gods. In China, when I was in Beijing, I mean, it's impressive. Every time you walk around, you'll see the Hall of Supreme Harmony or the Gate of Heavenly Peace. Well, once again, heaven is here on earth if you can build it. Supreme harmony between the rich and the poor and the educated and the less educated, the different classes. Supreme harmony is the goal of Confucian society. Harmony between people, prosperity, peace. And so it is a this worldly religion. Now, Confucianism is also hierarchical. At the very top, you have heaven. Well, heaven is not up in heaven, it is here on earth, a perfect society here on earth. So when you hear the word heaven or God, you always have to interpret, what does that mean? Is it God a person? Is it a power? 
or is it an idea of a perfect society? So you have the perfect society as the top. Well, then you go down and you have the emperor, or today, President Xi of China, Chinese government, Chinese state. Then you have your religion. You live in Hong Kong. You live in Manchuria. You live in Shanghai. That's your re region. Your clan. This is your family that you belong to. You're born into an extended family, uh, which is usually uh, many, many people. In fact, big countries like uh, Korea say that everybody in Korea is divided into five different clans. One of the biggest clans is the Park, P-A-R-K clan, which can include millions of people, but they are your very distant relatives. Then you get down to the family. That is mother and father and the children, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins. These are the members of your family who you are closely associated with. Then comes the individual. So when you look at this uh, chart, you see that the individual, me, is almost at the bottom of the society. So that's why in China today, when the government says uh, lockdown because of COVID-19, well, everybody follows the rules. It's not like in the United States where everybody says, oh, I don't want to lock down. I don't want vaccine. I don't want to have to do things for the good of society. In America, it's all me, me, me. Whereas in China, it is the family, the clan, the region, the state, the government, the emperor or president, which are before the individual. And then come the ancestors. Most Confucianists can name their ancestors going back five and six generations. I can do that because I'm a historian. But the average American, you might know your grandparents, but you vaguely remember your great grandparents, but that's about it. So Confucian society is hierarchical. The individual is at the bottom, almost at the bottom, and the perfect society ruled by the emperor or president is at the top. Almost the exact opposite of Western society where individual freedoms and individual rights would be at the top. Chinese society views itself as the gr uh, group of concentric circles. If you look at the map at the top on the right, see at the very center, there's a small circle with some Chinese writing inside. That is Peking, the center of the world. Around that is another area. These are the Han Chinese. These are the Chinese who speak Chinese and who are the vast majority of people in China. Next circle are overseas Chinese. These are the Chinese of Singapore, Flushing, Queens, Chinatown, New York. They are considered Chinese people who happen to be temporarily living outside of China. Next come the minorities, Tibet, Mongolia, the Western Muslim region of Xinjiang. These are Chinese minorities, but yet they are learning Chinese. They are assimilating into Chinese society. Then you have that black area with all these little islands floating in it. These are countries that have always recognized China and the Chinese emperor as the emperor at the center of the world. These are the Koreans, Japanese, Vietnamese, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Nepal, Malaysia, Indonesia who have always been considered the little brothers and the little sisters of great China. Then come other Asians who have been exposed to some Chinese culture. 
These would be the people of Siberia. These would be the Arabs, the Indians, people of India and Pakistan, who are slightly influenced by Chinese superior culture. Then come the barbarians. This is the black circle, the far area. And there you see one little dot is Africa. Another one is Europe. Another one is Latin America. And that would include the United States. So we are considered barbarians. We have not been exposed in any significant way to Chinese culture. Well, the Chinese view themselves as a the center of the world. And we see this map, which shows huge areas of Siberia, Central Asia, down into Thailand and Burma. This has always been the area of Chinese cultural influence. So when the king of Thailand is crowned, as the new king just was recently, traditionally he would send gifts to the great emperor in China, who would then recognize him as the new king of Thailand. In this area, Chinese culture has always influenced people. Vietnam, um, the Thais, the Burmese, the Koreans have always considered Chinese as their cultural language. These countries are strongly influenced by Confucius. Kowtow, when the Japan, when the uh, king of Thailand greets the emperor of China, he would lay on the floor three times. So outside of China, you only had kings. You didn't have emperors. And in fact, when I was in Thailand la last time, I was there for the Chinese New Year, where everybody celebrates the Chinese New Year, to show that they are influenced by Chinese culture. Well, for centuries, the Chinese were the leading and most powerful country in the world. Here we see this giant ship, which was built in the 1300s by the emperor and his great captain, Sheng He. Now, if you look at this Chinese boat in the background and compare it to Christopher Columbus's little boat that he crossed the Atlantic in 1492, you can see that the Chinese were technologically far ahead of the Europeans. Cheng He went all over Asia, went over to Africa, some people say he even went around Africa and maybe even crossed the Atlantic long before Christopher Columbus was even born. Chinese were a major power for a thousand years. They invented printing, gunpowder, art, porcelain. Their writing system was considered superior to any of the European or Middle Eastern uh, writing systems. So the Chinese say they are the oldest continuously existing civilization on the face of the earth. Their writing is the oldest system in continuous use. Their art is still venerated around the world. So the Chinese are convinced that yes, they are at the center of the world, that Chinese culture is superior to all other cultures. Here we see Zheng Yi's voyages from Nanjing down around uh, Ayutthaya, the old capital of Thailand, down into Indonesia, visiting India, up into the Middle East where they visit, he visited Mecca and Medina, and then down along the coast of Africa. In fact, when he visited Africa, he brought back a herd of giraffes on his giant ship and elephants 
Now, you can imagine Christopher Columbus couldn't even squeeze one giraffe onto his little dinky boat, but Chang He was exporting textiles and porcelain and importing ivory, ebony, wood, um, treasures from the Middle East, spices from India. And so China <coughs> was a major world power. In fact, for centuries, the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Well, this began to decline with the rise of Europe. First Holland and Spain and Portugal, and then later on France and Great Britain and Russia started taking over the world. You look at the map, you see the blue area. You see France took over about a third of Africa. It even took over Quebec and eventually conquered Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, pushing out the Chinese domination. You see England, the pink area. Well, it took over Canada, a long time the United States, big chunks of Africa, Egypt, South Africa, conquered India, Pakistan, Burma, conquered Australia and New Zealand. Spain took over South America. Russia expanded, pushing over into Siberia, grabbing big chunks of China, many of which it controls until today. The United States got involved in conquering the world and we took over the Philippines. And as we're gonna see, we even invaded China and burned half of Peking and looted the country. This is what the Chinese call the century of humiliation from 1842 to 1945. Well, the Europeans were not just grabbing Africa, grabbing the Middle East, grabbing South Asia, grabbing Siberia and the Americas, but they also planned to divide up China itself. Here we see in the top, in the top right-hand corner, a big chunk was grabbed by Russia. Japan took a big chunk. England took Hong Kong and a big chunk of Southern China. Even the Russians grabbed a part of China and made it into their colony. So the Europeans were going to do to China what they did to Africa. That's why there are hundreds of little tiny countries in Africa, because each country in Europe grabbed what it wanted to, set up a little country, and Africa today remains totally chopped up. The same thing in the Middle East. The French took a big chunk, the British took a big chunk, the Russians took a chunk, even the Jews got organized and took over Palestine, kicked out the Palestinians and turned it into a Jewish state. This is what could have happened to China and the Europeans and the Americans were planning on chopping China up into little independent countries. Even the Americans got involved. See the walls of the Forbidden City in China with the American flag on top, burning big parts of, of Peking, looting the country. Railroad cars were filled with porcelain, with golden statues of the Buddha, with silk cloth, everything shipped over to the United States and sold to the Metropolitan Museum and other museums. Here again, this is part of the century of humiliation. One of the reasons why the Chinese don't trust the Americans. They invaded in the year 1900, looted the city, and so the Chinese have no love for these brutal Americans. In fact, the Chinese are demanding the return of all of these art treasures that were stolen by the Americans. Just like the Jews are demanding the return of their art collections, their businesses, 
their houses that the Nazis stole and in trial and in courthouses, the Jews are getting their belongings back that were stolen by Hitler. Well, the Chinese say, well, it's time for the Americans to return all of these looted objects. And here you see an article in December 20, 2009, where uh, they were reporting that the Chinese were going through museums, taking pictures, taking down information of all of the treasures that were stolen by the American military when they invaded China. Well, these were the Chinese who started migrating to America. It was uh, even before the independence of the country, we know that there were Chinese in America. In fact, here in New York, there were Chinese. If you look at the picture at the bottom on the left, you see Dutch New Amsterdam, and you see the ships. Well, the number one export of the Dutch colony was beaver skin. See that on the top in the middle, you see the little beaver, and that's an early seal of New York City, because beaver skin was waterproof. And so if you had a coat or boots or a hat or even an umbrella made out of beaver skin, it was naturally waterproof. And so these poor little animals were hunted and their pelts were exported, not only to Europe, but to China. And in the ships would go to China. They had to go the whole way around South America. So it was a long trip. And in China, they would load up with Chinese tea, with porcelain, or making cups and plates for silk clothing. Beautiful treasures brought over from China. They were paid for by beaver pelts. Well, a lot of the young sailors on those boats, going the whole way across the Atlantic, with storms and diseases and everything, by the time these ships got to China, and were selling the beaver pelts and loading up with tea and silk and porcelain and other treasures, these ships needed young men, soldiers, and sailors. So they would hire young Chinese guys who just wanted some adventure. They'd get on the ship, they'd work as sailors and cooks and cleaners and sail back to New York or to Boston or Philadelphia. And there they would say, okay, well, we're here. We'll work for a while. We'll earn some money, get into business, open a little store, Chinese restaurant, why not? And so already in the 1600s, there were a handful of Chinese in New York. Now, most of them would come over. They would work, save their money in gold coins, get on a ship going back to China, and they would buy land, they'd buy a farm, they'd buy a house, they'd set up a business. So they were temporary residents in New York. And this is the kind of ship that they would be sailing on. And here you see a big map, an old map. Everything is sort of not quite uh, in good proportions, but you can see where the United States is and New York. Ships had to go the whole way down the Atlantic, around South America, across the Pacific to get to China. And so there were Chinese sailors showing up in New York and the other East Coast cities. They were sort of an oddity. You know, everybody looked at them. They were strange. And they would stay, work hard, save their money, and then go back to China. Well, two rather famous Chinese uh, uh, became, um, attracted a lot of attention. These are the famous Siamese twins. They were from Siam, which is modern, the old name of Thailand. But they were Chinese living in Thailand. Their names were Cheng and Eng. 
And they were Siamese twins, which means they were attached at birth uh, at their stomachs. Well, they were discovered by some traders uh, in the early 1800s. And in 1829, they were brought to America where they became circus freaks. And that's why we have Siamese twins because they were from Siam. Well, they eventually were very good businessmen. And so they eventually left the circus and set up their business on their own. And they got married. They married two sisters. Together, they had 21 children. And they died in 1874. Must have been quite an experience to the two men, since they can't be separate. Um, going to bed with their wives. It must have been quite an interesting um, uh, arrangement. But if they together had 21 children, uh, they must have found a way to, um, uh, uh, to have this type of strange marriage. So in the beginning, uh, you had a few Chinese businessmen in New York, and then early 1800s, you had another uh, example of Chinese, and these were the exotic Siamese twins. In New York, the Chinese settled on Mott Street, which is uh, between Little Italy and um, uh, the Lower East Side. It, it's, uh, it's one street that goes down and curves around. And the Chinese naturally congregated on this street. For some reason, I don't know why. Maybe the rents were cheap. Or maybe the first Chinese went there and then he just invited over some of his family and they moved into the next apartment and opened a store nearby. And gradually Chinatown started emerging. Well, the first Chinese person we know a good bit about was a guy named Ah Ken, who was in New York during the 1840s. Well, what were the Chinese going to do as business? Well, we know about the Chinese laundry, so-called washi washies. We know that the Chinese were very good in making candy, which the peddlers would sell on the street. They were also very good at making cigars from tobacco. And they were famous for selling candy on the streets corners, selling their cigars to the bankers and the business people. And gradually they would open maybe a cigar store or a candy store, which would then grow into a grocery store, Chinese restaurants. Now, most of the Chinese in the early years were single men. Once again, they'd come over for a couple of years. And then when they had made some money, they would go back to China, find a wife and set up a business of their own. So many of them lived in rooming houses, not an apartment, but a rooming house where there would be someone who would cook breakfast and supper, who would wash the clothes, uh, and there would be four or five guys, working guys, sleeping in one room, very often one bed. Uh, and then they'd get up and go to work because they were here to earn money and then to go back to China. They were not family units. Other Chinese, we have some documentation on. There was a guy, William Brown, who adopted that name, who was Chinese. Some of the Chinese, when they became rather prosperous, they decided to stay in New York. Well, 1820s, 30s, and 40s was the time of the Irish potato famine. Many Irish were fleeing the famine, arriving in New York with nothing. So when a rather successful businessman, a Chinese man, would ask, a poverty-stricken Irish girl to marry him, they usually said yes. And so you got a whole group of half Irish and half Chinese. They took Irish names, children were raised Catholic. Many of these became cops. It was a whole tradition of Chinese Irish cops in New York. 
1850, we know of approximately 150 Chinese who were, came over as sailors who were living in New York. Well, these were men, young men, and this was a bachelor society. So you can imagine, you get 150 young guys working hard all day. Well, what are they going to do in the evening? They don't have wives and children to go home to. So they go to a bar and they drink, they smoke, they start taking drugs, they start dancing, playing cards, hanging out with prostitutes, white prostitutes, uh, who um, very um, skillfully manage to take their money from them. So Chinatown along Mott Street started getting a bad reputation. It was gambling, it was opium, it was other drugs, it was thieves, it was prostitutes, uh, it was alcohol. And so Chinatown started getting a bad reputation. Of course, you went there for your cigars and your candy, and they, the guys lived in rooming houses. Chinatown was filled with bars and gambling, which was a good business for the Chinese to get into. And white people would go down and gamble and drink. You know, they'd get some prostitutes, maybe even have an opium uh, party. New sailors would arrive and would come in and a constantly changing and slowly growing population of Chinatown. By 1868, only 10 of the Chinese um, were American citizens, since most of them um, didn't plan to stay anyways. And in the mid 1800s, it wasn't a question of ID cards and passports and all those kinds of things weren't very restrict, uh, restrictive. So they didn't bother becoming citizens, but they made money. You see the Chinese restaurants and stores. Below that, you see an opium den where the Chinese were running the place and you know, white men and women would go and uh, take their drugs. A lot of the Chinese had stores where they would sell um, spices and exotic foods. And by 1880, there were an estimated 2,000 Chinese in New York City. Well, a huge number of Chinese migrated to the United States, not to New York, but to the Pacific coast with the discovery of gold in 1849. It was known that there was gold there. And that's one of the reasons why the United States went to war against Mexico and stole Texas and California and everything in between because they knew that there was gold there. So that was the gold rush. All kinds of people from not only the East Coast of the United States, but Europe and especially China flocked to California once again, hoping to get rich and go back to China or to Europe with bags of gold. 25 thousand Chinese migrated by 1850, the year following the gold rush, the Pacific coast was a veritable Chinese colony. But of course, women weren't coming over. 20 men for every one Chinese woman was the rule because they all planned to get rich and go back to China. And so you see on the picture on the right, you know, the three white prospectors, and they had employed three or possibly four Chinese workers um, to help them. Other Chinese uh, went out on their own once they learned how to prospect for gold, make a land claim, and many did get rich and went back to China. Well, a second big immigration was caused by the building of the Transcontinental Railroad 
which would go from Sacramento and San Francisco, California, across the country to New York. Well, by the 1860s, the eastern part of the United States already had a lot of railroads, as you can see. But to go across to California, you still had to take a ship go the whole way around South America, up across the, uh, up along the Pacific to California. So beginning during the Civil War and ending in 1869, the stretch of the railroad from California to Omaha, Nebraska, where the railroad linked up with the railroads of the East was being built. Well, of course, they needed laborers. So tens of thousands of Chinese were brought over, once again, men, put to work on the railroad. San Francisco Chinatown began to grow. By 1870, 63,000 Chinese in the United States, the vast majority in California and the West. By 1880, 22,000 Chinese in San Francisco. Once again, opening restaurants, as you see in the picture, opening laundries, washi washies, where you didn't have to speak English, you had your famous Chinese laundry in every town. Grocery stores selling spices and noodles and dried meats and all kinds of exotic Chinese fruits and vegetables. The Chinese were hard workers. Remember Confucianism. There's no heaven when you die, so you better make your heaven here on earth. Work hard, raise a family. But still, even at this late date, they were predominantly men who came over, and very, very few women. <clears throat> well, all these men living in San Francisco and other cities in the West, as well as New York, of course, then it, Chinatown meant prostitution, it meant opium, it meant gambling, it meant wild dancing, prostitutes, and so there was an anti-Chinese movement. This is called nativism, where the old Americans, white Americans from Europe started saying, we are the true Americans, stop Chinese immigration. Terrible stories were told about crime in Chinatown, where a prostitute would be found dead. Of course, they blamed it on the Chinese. Nice boys from college would come back to New York from Harvard or Yale for a weekend in New York. Well, these young guys went off to Chinatown, and if they woke up the next morning, they had no money, no shoes. And um, of course, they blamed it on the Chinese, or at least their parents did. So you see a book on the left, Tong Wars. These are the Chinese gangs that were fighting. The untold story of vice, money, and murder in New York's Chinatown. So the Chinese started getting a very bad reputation, and nice white Christian Americans uh, were getting opposed to more Chinese immigration. And in the eyes of many Christian Americans, the Chinese worshiped idols. You go into the Buddhist temple, you see at the bottom on the right on Mutt Street in, Ch in Chinatown, or any other temple, you are going to see a big statue of the Buddha, or you're going to see a statue of Confucius. And so for the eyes of, in the eyes of many Christians, the Buddhists were idol worshipers, graven images, which is condemned in the Ten Commandments. And of course, the Chinese were not going to give up their religion and their traditions. And so they refused to convert to, to the 
Christian religion, which caused a lot of Americans to get very, very anti-Chinese. They said, who are these Chinese to refuse the saving message of Christianity? Well, the Christians in China were having even less success than among the Chinese of America. In the 18, mid 1800s, the English joined by the other Europeans and eventually the Americans were buying so much from China that the Chinese needed extra money. And so the Europeans and the Americans invaded China beginning in the first opium war and forced the Chinese to legalize the opium trade. And thousands of Chinese were dying from drug overdoses, just like today. But the United States wanted to make money. Great Britain and France and Germany wanted to make money. So they forced China to legalize opium. Could you imagine if the countries of South America would gang up and force the United States to legalize heroin and pot and every other thing so that you could just walk down to the street corner and buy your drug, sit down on a chair, uh, stick the needle in your arm, and who cares whether you died or not? This was a way for the Europeans to make money. And so as China was getting weaker during the century of humiliation, Europeans invaded and forced China to legalize the opium trade. They forced China to permit Christian missionaries into the country, bringing in Bibles and trying to convert the Chinese to Christianity and turn them all into drug addicts. Well, this anti-Chinese sentiment continued to grow. Finally, beginning in 1882, the American government in Washington stopped all Chinese immigration. These were called the Chinese Exclusion Acts. And even the Chinese who were here were being kicked out of California, sent back to China. The Chinese were not allowed to get married. They were not a, had a lot of restrictions on them. They could not become American citizens. And so the government, beginning in 1882, for the first time in its history, made illegal the immigration of a group into the United States. The only other time this was even attempted was under Donald Trump when he tried to stop Muslim immigration, and that didn't work out very well. But the Chinese ban on immigration was the law of the land. So gradually the Chinese population began to diminish and become smaller all the time. Well, the Americans wanted to build a wall to keep out the Chinese, just like Donald Trump wants to build a wall to keep out the Mexicans and stop Muslim immigration. This was a time of terrible racism, discrimination in the United States. Well, most Americans were happy with the end of Chinese immigration. They refused to become Christians. They wanted the Chinatowns to die out and disappear. Well, the Chinese century of humiliation came to an end in 1945, when Mao Zedong conquered China, kicked out the Americans, kicked out the Japanese, and declared that the age of humiliation had come to an end. See the Chinese poster on the left, Chinese soldiers kicking out 
the Americans, and you see the American flag all tattered and torn. China was once again independent. Well, the gates of immigration in the United States were still closed beginning in 1882. Chinese were not only forbidden to immigrate, but even those who were here were being rounded up and expelled from the country. This anti-Asian immigration period continued between the world wars, after World War I during the 1920s, during World War II, and it only came to an end in 1965 when Congress reopened the gates of immigration. If you look at the chart on the left, you see high point of immigration 1910, that no Asians were included until 1970. The United States was becoming a white Christian country. Even Jews were not welcome in the United States during many of these years. That was a major problem during World War II, that the United States did not accept Jewish refugees from Europe because we still wanted to remain a Donald Trump style white Christian country. Well, by 1965, the government decided to reopen the gates of immigration. We needed more workers in factories and on farms. And so the gates were thrown open. Look at the chart on the right. You see the rise in immigration. But look at who was coming. Small number of Europeans, large numbers of Asians, large numbers of Latin Americans, growing number of Africans. So the new people coming in were basically Latin Americans and Asians. Well, this was a period of new neighborhoods. It was during this period, following 1965, that Flushing became a Chinese and Asian neighborhood. Jackson Heights, not far from where I live in Queens, became a Hispanic neighborhood. Washington Heights in, up new, in Manhattan became a Dominican neighborhood. Every borough in New York and around the country had its Chinatown, its Chinese restaurants, its Chinese stores. Gradually, New York started attracting more and more population. See a recent chart of population. Dominicans, 12.4. Chinese, 11.4, Mexicans, Jamaicans, Guyana, Ecuador, Haiti, Trinidad, Tobago, India, Russia, all of these new immigrants becoming the majority of the population in New York City. Very soon, Chinese grew and became the largest immigrant group in New York City. <clears throat> Gradually, some 5 million Chinese migrated to the United States, plus another 15 million Asians. And by Asians, we mean Arabs, Indians, Pakistanis, people from Thailand, Japanese. All of these different Asians were migrating to the United States in huge numbers. Once again, the Asians, especially the South Asians, the Vietnamese, Cambodians, Thais, Burmese, Chinese, Japanese, uh, were Confucianist. Once again, if you're gonna be happy, it's up to you. It's up to you to work hard here in this life because when you're dead, you're dead. There's no heaven waiting for you with all the pizza and Budweiser beer you could possibly want. The Chinese say, get rich and buy your pizza and Budweiser beer here and now. That's why the Chinese work so hard. Stuyvesant High School, the best um, public high school in New York City, 
74% Asian. They're trying to institute some quotas for um, um, disadvantaged groups like white Christians, African-Americans, Hispanics, Jews, who are just too lazy to work hard and to take the tests and to get into Stuyvesant. In fact, it's a problem for the Ivy League schools. They're trying to limit the number of highly qualified Asians and force these universities to have a quota of a certain number of African-Americans, Hispanics, whites, and Jews, because at a place like Harvard, if the students were admitted just on education and ability, these universities would be 99% Asian because they are hard workers. Christians and Muslims and Jews are still sitting around waiting for happiness in heaven after they die, where the Chinese are building their happiness here on earth. Chinatowns emerged everywhere. Every neighborhood has its Chinese restaurants. It has its Chinese grocery store, films about the Chinese in Brooklyn. In fact, the Chinatown of Lower Manhattan has completely swallowed up what was once Little Italy, the Jewish Lower East Side. These are all Chinese and Asian ethnic neighborhoods. In China, you see Mott Street in the picture on the left, filled with Chinese businesses. You have the Chinese American Planning Council in Brooklyn. You're again encouraging Chinese to move in, to buy buildings, open up businesses, exploring the Chinese food scene in Flushing, an old Dutch town in Queens is now a Chinese city. Chinese restaurants, Chinese takeout in the Bronx. Staten Island has several Chinatowns. Mm. Well, all of these Chinese migrating, not just to New York and to around the world, are being encouraged by the Chinese government. In fact, I was in China and Shanghai not too terribly long ago, and I saw a big poster up on the wall, and it said the Chinese government wants college graduates who speak English to migrate to South Africa. As you can see from the chart here, there are uh, 300, there were 350,000 Chinese who had migrated to South Africa. The Chinese government paid their passage, gave them money to open businesses, even bribed the government officials to get them ID cards and even South African passports. So why was the Chinese government sending all these Chinese to South Africa? To take over the diamond and the gold industry. Same thing they're doing in Mexico, becoming Mexican citizens and buying up all these big hotels in Cancun. 10 million Chinese in Thailand. In fact, they say the royal family of Thailand has more Chinese blood than it does Thai. And so around the world, this is government sponsored migration. Go to Brazil, buy huge tracts of agricultural land and export all of the meat, the soybeans, the corn, and everything else to supply the Chinese market. In Africa, I was in Ethiopia not long ago, huge Chinatown there, building railroads, hotels, sports stadiums, highways. Chinese are um, very aggressive. So what is going to be the future of China? Well, China is rising. And the age of humiliation that ended in 1945, Mao Zedong, who died in 1976, came power in 1949, 
And saying China is back. China is once again a great power and will dominate the world. So when all the Chinese migrate to the United States, the Chinese view them as Chinese um, people living in the United States to take over the economy. So China is rising, the huge population in America, in Brazil, in Europe, in Thailand uh, is growing. The Chinese are taking over economies around the world. In fact, many people say that the rise of China is being marked by the decline of the United States. Even Superman movies in the future, Superman is no longer a nice white Christian European, but the Superman of the future will be Chinese and Uncle Sam is being left out in the cold. Because of their Confucian mentality, even though today they are communists, but I always say communism is simply Confucius painted red because the Chinese communists are atheists. They don't believe in gods and heavens and ghosts and angels and devils and all this kind of stuff. They say, this life is all you get. So build bridges, build factories, become rich, become powerful, go to America, take over entire sectors of the economy, go to Brazil, and take over thousands of square miles of good agricultural land. And so the Chinese, and especially the Chinese in America, are viewed as part of this Chinese domination of the future. A lot of books are being written on this. You see, my favorite, When China Rules the World by Martin Jacques. In the middle, the China threat, how the People's Republic of China targets America, rising China and its postmodern fate. I mean, China is on a roll. I mean, go to Flushing. Every time I take the train and go there, I see 10 or 15 new skyscrapers going up, and it is turning into a giant Asian-run city. The Chinese plan to dominate the future, first economically. Very soon, if not already, the Chinese economy will be stronger than the American economy. Still an argument, who's number one? In certain sectors, China is by far the most powerful. Other sectors, the United States is still powerful. But China is on an economic growth curve. Military, the number of ships in the, in the Navy of China far exceeds that of any other country in the world. Cultural, more and more young people are going to China and learning Chinese. If I was 21 years old again, I would not go to Europe like I did for a big chunk of my education. I would be in China, the country of the future. And political, I mean, China is um, spreading its political philosophy of communism, but capitalistic communism. And when you look at the sad state of the American economy with Republicans and Democrats battling out for every little law that needs to be passed, the Chinese model is strong central government and the people follow the rules. <clears throat> Industrialization, Chinese are building factories all over the world. They are building bridges, highways. They are building uh, railroads, taking over ports in Italy. In fact, the port in Haifa in Israel was recently bought by the Chinese as part of their economic 
expansion. Chinese are the largest steel producers. They are, um, as we approach the Christmas time, as I'm speaking, they have all the ships unable to unload all of the toys and stuff that the Americans need for Christmas because nothing is being produced in the United States anymore. This is the famous Silk Road um, uh, highway and railroad system and shipping lanes, shipping everything from China across Asia by railroads and by ship through the uh, Suez Canal to Europe. Most of the countries of Europe now do more business with China than they do with the United States. Most of the countries of Asia and Africa have more trade and more business with China than they do with the United States. Chinese even claim Siberia, saying Siberia is not part of European Russia, but that should be the new area for Chinese expansion. In fact, there are many cities in Siberia now that have more Chinese residents than they do Russian. Culturally, Chinese influence is growing. The Confucius Institutes. I visited the one at NYU in New York, but you see them all over Binghamton University. Every major university of any importance has a very large Chinese Confucius Institute where you can take classes in Chinese, where you are instructed in Chinese history, um, uh, they, they train foreigners to teach the Chinese language. They offer scholarships for foreign students to spend a year or a semester in China, learning Chinese culture, language, music, dance, and of course, the martial arts, which is a great attraction. So is China going to replace the United States? Is the United States declining power? Chinese movies are now world famous, right at the bottom. This is at the University of Yaoundé, number two, the Confucius Institute. When I was in Cameroon, I visited the Institute. It was fascinating to see African women learning Chinese dances. Students are now getting scholarships to study Chinese. No longer French and English are enough, but you have to learn the language of the future. Chinese summer programs, taking students from around the world to China for a year. So is the future going to be one of Chinese and American cooperation or conflict. These, this is the question which is going to dominate the future. Books like Issues in 21st Century World Politics, Globalization, are they going to continue? Is the future going to be dominated by China, Chinese language, Chinese businesses? Or is the West, Europe and America, still going to remain the dominating force of the future? Well, it is an open question. Is the future going to be American dominated or is the American century coming to a sudden halt? And is China going to dominate the 21st century and maybe even the third millennium. So if you are a young student today, don't waste your time on European and Western stuff. Get on a plane, go and spend a year abroad in China because the future of the world is probably going to be Chinese 
dominated. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you learned something. And if you need a letter of recommendation for your trip to China, just contact me and we'll see what we can work out. So once again, this is Dr. Ronald Brown, thanking you for joining me today in this class, and I hope to see you sometime in the future. Okay, thank you very much, and have a good day.